Um, on behalf of the Friends of the Oak Park Conservatory, we are delighted to welcome you to our first Learn and Grow lecture of the year. We've been waiting for this, we've been planning for it. As part of the Friends mission, we want to help educate and inspire gardeners to become more confident in their endeavors. And so to that end, this month we are hosting our popular Learn and Grow series uh, for three Wednesdays in April, starting tonight. Um, obviously tonight we've got tomatoes. Next week, um, Suzette Gasek is on this um, Zoom tonight. Uh, she will be doing our square foot gardening presentation. You do not want to miss that, so be sure to sign up for that. It's a free lecture. Um, next Wednesday, and then the following week, um, we will have Sandy Lentz, um, who is um, intimately aware of all the plants we're growing for the plant sale, and she's going to give us a behind the scenes tour and talk about companion planting and how to harden off your plants and things like that. So um, the next three Wednesdays, um, spend them with us at FOPCON, and then be sure to tune in in May when we host West Cook Wild Ones um, to learn about how to incorporate natives into your landscape. I just want to mention that as a member of the Friends of the Oak Park Conservatory, you can take advantage of our early shopping for the annual plant sale. It opened this week. It's our biggest fundraiser of the year. And um, the plant sale will open to the public on April 18th. So anybody who's a member really gets kind of um, early access to those plants and the biggest uh, selection of plants. Uh, the sale features a large selection of vegetables, herbs, flowers, including many unique varieties that are all grown at our conservatory greenhouses. So the picture that comes up um, after this is actually a shot I took of our plants growing in the greenhouses. Um, this one right here. Um, I just took this two days ago. Okay, so that's our gorgeous one of our gorgeous plants that we'll be selling. So enough about me. Let's talk about Dwayne, um, our special guest this evening. Dwayne Dupee is a Chicago native and a lifelong gardener. His experience includes a wide variety of plants, fruits, veggies, aquatics, you name it. Dwayne is a past officer of many garden clubs, a garden blog writer, a volunteer at Garfield Park Conservatory and the Oak Park Conservatory, and has been featured in Better Homes and Gardens magazine. He's also received multiple awards from the city of Chicago. Dwayne is a beekeeper, an enthusiastic cook, and is known for his 10 foot plus tall tomato plants, which we'll see some pictures of tonight. Dwayne shares his produce with about 30 friends and neighbors and preserves much of it. Dwayne is happy to share his tomato tips with us and enthusiasm for growing tonight. I also want to introduce my co-host this evening, Kayla Chase. She's our membership chair for the Friends of the Oak Park Conservatory. Uh, she's also a master gardener and she will manage our chat. So make sure that you use the chat box to put your questions in and um, we will get started. So Dwayne, I'm going to spotlight you and I am going to pull up our presentation. So give us a second folks and we'll get rolling here. And here it is. Okay, so give me just one second, Dwayne, and then we can roll because I wanna get this as big as possible for the screen. Okay, can you see that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, take it away, Dwayne. Thank you for the kind words, Judy. And uh, I'm glad to be doing this for FOPCON. I think gardening is all about sharing and uh, knowledge is a continual process. What I'm sharing is not necessarily Bible, uh, according to the Bible. We all have different theories, different methods. This is what has worked for me. Some of this is, uh, you know, there's different approaches, different alternatives. But uh, one of my earliest memories is being in the garden and has to do with tomatoes. It wasn't the Garden of Eden, but I will date myself by telling you that I was wearing cloth diapers. I was planting tomatoes or assisting with my mom. She was uh, had a, a trowel, her tomato plants, a bucket of water, and a soup ladle. I was out there with a diaper on, probably about a year old, and my job was to follow after my mother when she put the plants in the ground, I was supposed to water them with the soup ladle. Well, this was kind of a no-win situation. Uh, a win, I'm sorry, a win-win situation. I couldn't really do any damage, spill water on anything that's, you know, kind of like indoors or, you know, hurt anything. 
And if some of the water got on the tomato plants, so much the better. Uh, tomatoes have been in culture for about 2,500 years. The thought to have originated in South America about present day Peru. And they were cultivated by, definitely by the Aztec Indians in uh, Mexico, made their way to Europe about, well, in the 1600s. They became popular in the Mediterranean countries in Southern Europe. They never were accepted or it took a long time for them to be accepted in England. And one reason is theorized that uh, it resembled a fruit in England that was called the devil's apple which was poisonous, and they were long thought to be toxic or poisonous. Now, in England, it was fairly well-to-do at that time, and people ate a lot of uh, their meals off of pewter plates, and in the inns, they would be serving on pewter. They theorized that the acid in the tomatoes may have actually leaked, uh, leached some of the lead out of the pewter, and of course, lead is toxic, and that might be why it had a reputation of being, you know, toxic or poisonous in England. It took a while for the British to accept tomatoes. Pizza was invented in Italy, Naples, by a baker about 1880. The popularity of pizza did a lot for promoting tomatoes. The first pizza, the baker wanted to make something as a tribute to the Queen of Italy, Margarita. And he wanted colors that would reflect the Italian flag, white, red, and green. So he had mozzarella, tomato sauce, and basil. And to this day, a margarita pizza has those ingredients and is still pretty popular. With the huge waves of migration, not just to this country, but worldwide, the late 1800s, early 1900s, and the mixing of cultures, tomatoes became very widespread, and there isn't a country in the world that doesn't have tomatoes right now. So in growing tomatoes, one of our first considerations for Tomatoes 101 is what use do we want to put the tomatoes to? Do you want a tomato for slicing that you're going to have on a hamburger, on a sandwich? Do you want a cherry tomato that you can eat out of hand, you can pop in your mouth, again can be used for salads? Do you want a tomato that you're going to uh, grow on your patio? Do you want one that you're going to make sauce? Uh, you're gonna preserve, you're gonna can it. What is your purpose? That will help you in deciding what type of tomato you wanna to grow and uh, you know where you wanna grow it. If you're gonna grow it, say you're in an apartment or a condo, a townhouse, you might not have much space for gardening. You might be gardening on a balcony, a terrace. Uh, a consideration too when you're off, uh, planning on growing a tomato is whether you're going to start it from seed or you're going to buy plants. If you're going to start it by seed, the advantage is that it's a little more reasonable. Uh, you have to start them. It uh, takes about seven to ten days for germination. If you have a heat mat, it helps speed the germination. And uh, as far as soil, you want a general purpose uh, soil. You can use jiffy pots, you can use trays, you can use almost anything, Dixie cups to start your seeds in. Some people have used eggshells and uh, even ice cream cones, which are biodegradable. If you sow your seed in an ice cream cone, it sprouts, you bury the whole, plant the whole ice cream cone in the garden and uh, it's done. Uh, What's most popular, if you're gonna grow it from seed, you need a good source of light, either a southern window or a western facing one where you get a lot of light or good uh, lamps. You can use fluorescence. It doesn't have to be uh, a grow light bulb. And probably to have the light source about 12 inches, 10 to 12 inches above your seedlings and adjust it. If you're growing from seed, your tomatoes are gonna to have to be hardened off before you bring them outside and put them in your garden. It's the same like a person, if we've been in all winter long, we go out on a sunny day, whether you're in your garden, on a golf course, whatever you're doing outdoors, if you don't apply sunscreen, 
you're going to get burnt. If you've sprouted tomatoes inside your house, even under the in the brightest window, that sunlight is less than the sunlight in shade outdoors. So you have to put your tomato seedlings, if you've grown them from seed, put them outside on a few warm days in a shaded spot that's also sheltered. The wind outside can just crack off your seedlings if they are not hardened off, if they're, you know, gawky, uh, gangly and that sort of thing, if they're not real uh, stiff. Uh, I don't have a good light source and I do start a lot of tropical plants that I overwinter, a lot of bulbs under some light. So I tend to go with the uh, buying transplants. Uh, you can buy them in cell packs with three or four plants, or you can buy a larger size in a four inch pot or bigger. Bigger isn't necessarily better. It will give you a little bit of a head start with your uh, maturity. You might have a few earlier tomatoes, but tomatoes like heat. And once you have some really warmer, sunny days, they take off. So if you have smaller plants from uh, cell packs, you're not at much of a disadvantage. There's quite a price differential if you're buying them that way. I'm rather thrifty. I actually look for the little cell pack that has additional seedlings in it. Instead of having four, maybe you'll find one in the tray that has five or six. And when I plant them, I just separate them. Another consideration besides uh, when you're deciding what you're gonna grow, tomatoes kind of fall into two classes. One are called determinant. Determinant tomatoes are genetically bred they grow to a certain size, they bloom, uh, they have most of their fruit at the same time, and then they're finished. Uh, these plants are greater for better used for a patio or a small space, or somebody who likes to have most of their tomatoes maturing at the same time, if you're gonna can them, if you're gonna you know, do some processing like that. Indeterminate tomatoes keep growing. So uh, they can get 10 feet tall, plus uh, they grow pretty much until we have a killing frost in our climate, in our zone, and uh, they will also continue to produce tomatoes all that, uh, that for a uh, length of time. Another classification on tomatoes is heirloom versus hybrid. Heirloom tomatoes are tomato plants that have been grown in a pure state, they're not genetically inbred. So they haven't been cross-pollinated. They've been grown purely uh, that variety for 40 plus years. Some of the heirlooms go back over a hundred years. Heirloom tomatoes generally have a better taste. There's more of a color variety. You can find some that are purple, almost black, striped. Uh, they are known for their taste. They have a thinner skin. They do, uh, they're a little more fragile. They do not produce large numbers and they do not have the disease resistance that many of the hybrids do. Hybrid tomatoes have been inbred to improve certain characteristics. They want a greater yield so that you get more tomatoes per plant. Uh, they also have been inbred that's crossing one with another so that uh, you, know, you improve certain characteristics. And the main benefit is with the disease resistance. Most hybrid tomatoes have been bred to have resistance to a lot of the common, like the wilting diseases and that sort of thing. Uh, depending on your use, if you're gonna, you know, want a huge yield, you're better off. If you'd like a variety of colors, which look wonderful when you have a salad or you have a dish, uh, that's available in the heirlooms and uh, taste. So that's another consideration, whether you're gonna buy seeds, plants, whether you want determinant plants that are gonna be on the shorter size and have the yield all at once, versus an indeterminate, or heirloom versus uh, hybrid. Slide two, please. Uh, 
When, plant, when planting tomatoes, there are certain requirements for the growth. Light. Tomatoes like as much sun as possible. That doesn't mean if you have an area that's semi, semi shady and that's all you have to work with that you shouldn't try growing tomatoes. You can grow tomatoes in less than ideal conditions where you don't have super amount of uh, sunlight. You're probably gonna get fewer tomatoes, a lower yield, and uh, maybe your plants won't be as vigorous, but it's still worth it and you will get, you know, some, you should get some tomatoes. You do need some sun, but uh, fairly shady if it's overcast or you have trees over your balcony or something, you still should be able to grow tomatoes, just uh, not as robust. The soil is very important. Uh, if you've been growing tomato, growing plants in your garden and you haven't had problems, I wouldn't worry too much about a lot of the soil amendments. If you don't know what you're doing, you can really kind of screw things up and it's a case where more is not better. You can have your soil tested. You can look up the Illinois uh, uh, University of Illinois Cooperative Farm uh, Extension Service. They will do that for a fee. If you call like the Botanic Gardens, they will at least be able to tell you where you might be able to have your soil tested. And some nursery uh, centers do offer that service. There might be a slight fee. If you're gonna have your soil tested, you should probably pick, take a, a Ziploc bag and take soil from different areas of your garden. Not your whole property, who cares what you know, your soil's like alongside your garage if you're not growing anything there. Take it from a few different areas of your garden, have it tested. Most of us, if your garden's been uh, producing, you've been happy with it, you don't need to uh, you know, worry about the soil test. Compost is a wonderful thing, whether your own compost from vegetable to table scraps, leaves, grass clippings, you can buy compost at a lot of nature centers on your box stores. Uh, some municipalities offer compost. I do a lot of my gardening in Michigan, most of it. I have a second home there. And our town, you have to bring your uh, yard waste to a, comp a city-owned compost center. That would be your grass clippings, your uh, prunings, your uh, leaves, that sort of thing. And it's composted there. They have front end loaders. They turn that frequently. They rent a machine once a year where they actually sift that. And your soil is being sifted. And after that sat for a year and has decomposed, you're welcome to go there and help yourself. I've been using it for my container plants and my raised beds. Very, very fertile. If you can add any compost to your soil before planting, a wonderful thing, it really improves it. Uh, I'm a firm believer in raised beds. Of course, getting older, you're not bending down to the ground. My raised beds, I've constructed myself the 12 inches high and uh, you control the soil. So mine is compost. Uh, raised beds drain better. So you don't have a problem with water sitting there. They warm up quicker because they're raised off the ground. And there's just many, many advantages, but mainly that you can control the soil. Tomatoes like a lot of water, uh, about an inch a week. If you're gonna be watering, you can pay attention if you've had a lot of rain, you know, a sufficient amount of rain, you don't have to water that, uh, that day. They like consistent moisture. You shouldn't allow the soil to get too dry and they do not like to have water on their leaves. If you can water from the base of the plant, so much the better. If you are using a sprinkler and you are gonna get water on the tomato leaves, which is the most susceptible part of the plant as far as disease, you know, incorporating diseases, water early in the day and do not water late afternoon when the water is gonna stay on the plant on the leaves overnight. You don't want them, you know, if you're watering in the early morning or midday, the sun's gonna dry it out pretty quickly, not a problem. If you're growing your tomatoes in a container, the water's a little more uh, important. You gotta watch because they're gonna dry out quicker. 
Whatever you use for a container plant, if you're growing these on a balcony or a patio, larger is better. I would suggest a five gallon bucket or larger even, and you wanna have drainage. So you wanna have a hole in the bucket, uh, you know, for, with a saucer underneath. You don't want water to sit underneath the tomato plants. And then mulch is also very good for growing. Whether it's in a pot, a container, or whether it's a raised bed or a flat garden, mulch on the surface, and I'm talking about grass clippings, I'm talking about straw. You can buy straw at a garden center where it's already kind of shredded. You're gonna scatter this on the surface after your plants are planted and growing, and it cuts down on the moisture evaporation anything like that, and I'm not talking about like rubber mulch, but anything that's biodegradable, it's going to shield the, cover the top layer of soil, it's gonna break down and enrich your soil, but keep that moisture there so it doesn't dry out as quickly. And a lot of the diseases on tomatoes are soil borne. So by having something covering the soil, when it's watering or whatever, or something's falling from a dead or diseased leaf, it's not going into the soil directly. A lot of these diseases bounce back and forth from the leaves on the tomato falling into the soil where the fungus or whatever is still alive and back and forth between the soil and the leaves on the plant. By having a layer of mulch, there's gonna be a lot of benefits, like I said, with your moisture, with your disease resistance, that sort of thing. The picture on the right shows a tomato plant that you're going to plant in the, into the garden. Now, tomatoes are very different from most other things that we plant. This would be perennials, it would be your bedding plants, even shrubs and trees. We're usually told to plant the plant at the same soil level as it was growing in a pot, at the nursery, whatever. Tomatoes are different. They will grow roots all along the stem. So the best advice is to leave about two sets of leaves. The leaves kind of grow in pairs opposite each other. So you wanna leave about four leaves at the top of the plant when you're planting it, planting it in your garden or your pot. Remove the lower leaves and that's an extra four or six inches that you're going to have underground when you plant your plant. You're gonna plant it deeply with just those top two sets of leaves above the soil line, you will get stronger roots and more roots, which are going to produce a stronger plant. We want the best possible plants. It's going to make a huge difference on your yield and on your disease resistance. So do plant your tomatoes deep, remove those lower leaves from the plant. And like I said, roots will form on uh, that part of the tomato. Next slide, please. Some other considerations in uh, planting tomatoes and growing tomatoes is spacing. With the heirlooms, it's more important to have them further apart because tomatoes benefit from having good air circulation. Uh, if tomatoes are right on top of each other, and I'm talking about within a foot or you know even a 12 inches apart, uh, any disease is going to pass much quicker uh, from plant to plant, and you don't have that air circulating. You need the air circulation, and it's more important with the heirlooms, which are a little trickier to grow. They do not have that inbred disease resistance. So spacing, and uh, the closest I've planted mine is about 12 inches apart. I'm going to stagger. I would have rows of three. My beds are four feet across. I would have about uh, three deep with a foot between each tomato. This year I'm only going to have two deep. I found that the ones that were the third row that were out to the north didn't get as much sun. So I think they'd benefit by uh, not having them even as close as I had them. Companion plants are very important when you plant tomatoes as far as other vegetables. You don't want to have a black walnut tree if there's one nearby. The roots secrete a substance, juglong. It's a natural defense mechanism for a walnut tree. It's injurious 
To many plants, it will stunt the growth of anything in the tomato family. So don't plant within a drip line uh, or root line of a black walnut tree. The roots extend out about the same as what would be the drip line. That's as far as your branches are going to go uh, if you uh, measured out from the tree. Anything in a brassilica family, this would be cabbage, broccoli, kale, uh, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, secretes a substance which also inhibits tomato growth. Good companion plants for tomatoes are beans, carrots, lettuce, dill. Uh, most, most of your herbs. One plant that's a wonderful companion plant for tomatoes is basil. And for several reasons, basil works, the flavor works great with tomatoes. If you're having a, a salad, bruschetta, if you're doing anything, uh, oh, a capri salad or whatever, but basil and tomatoes just go together really well. However, basil has a scent and the scent of the basil plant masks the scent of the tomatoes. If you're ever working with tomatoes and you're tying them up or you're pruning them, you get a little green on your hands and you get a smell that you wash off. Well, the scent of the basil plants mask the smell of the tomatoes for the type of moth that lays eggs on the tomatoes and turn into hornworms. Tomato hornworms are these big, ugly green things that can really decimate your tomato plants. And uh, basil discourages that moth from laying the eggs that produce the uh, hornworms. It also discourages thrips. thrips. Thrips are, oh, a small little insect that kind of sucks a lot of the juice out of the, uh, the plants. So many benefits to uh, using basil as a companion plant. It's not recommended that you plant anything in the same family as tomatoes. This would be the nightshade family. So peppers, eggplants, uh, and potatoes should not be planted in the same bed with tomatoes. I also think it's important to rotate your crops. And if you do have certain diseases, they stay in the soil for about three years. So it's best to rotate and to plant your plants in different areas every few years if you can. Uh, on that first picture up at the top, if I don't know if you can uh, focus on that or enlarge it a little bit, the tomatoes are in that back bed, but I have a whole row of basil planted in front. And uh, again, that's with the companion plants that the basil is really uh, helpful. Staking tomatoes. Most tomatoes are support, probably going to need support, even if they're grown in a container on a patio. Once the fruit comes, it can be fairly heavy and you can use tomato cages. Some of them are sturdier than others. Uh, most tomatoes, even if it's a bush type, are going to get about four feet tall. Four to, I've seen people take tomato cages, they invert one of them so that they have the wider circle that's normally at the top. They'll put that by the soil or, and have the tomato in the center. Take a second tomato cage the correct way and put that on top of the lower one. Bend one or two of the wires so they're connected together. And then you're going to have a tomato cage that's about five feet tall. You're still going to want to put a stake in there, uh, tie the cage on one side to the stake, and that will give you quite a bit of support for your tomatoes. For regular tomatoes, especially your indeterminate ones that can really take off, you can use bamboo. Uh, bamboo poles. You can use any type of, uh, I've used curtain rods, things like that. What I really prefer to use, and I've grown some very large plants, is conduit. Conduit are metal poles, they're hollow on the inside, come in quarter inch, I mean, I'm sorry, half inch and three quarter inch diameter. You can buy them at Menards, Home Depot. According to electrical code, if you have any electrical work done, the electrical cords can have to be in, inside of a piece of pipe, like the conduit. That's in case there's sparks. It's going to prevent a fire from uh, a potential fire from the sparks. Uh, if you have an electrical short or something, it's going to be contained in the metal. Well, these tubes are hollow. They sell for about three dollars, three twenty-nine a piece. I haven't checked lately, but they come in a ten-foot length. 
I can easily get them into the loose soil on my uh, raised beds, which is 12 inches deep, and without using a hammer or anything, just uh, you know, two hands and some body weight, I can get them in there 12 inches deep. And those are ideal supports for my tomatoes. They can be used year after year. And when you take them out and you just put them somewhere, they don't take much space. But I'm a strong component. I like component. I like proponent, I'm sorry, all about using conduit poles for my tomatoes. When should you stake them? I'd say when the tomato plant is about 18 to 20 inches tall, it's got some blossoms, maybe a little fruit. I put my tomatoes, uh, my stakes in then and start tying them. During the summer, they can grow quite a bit in a week and I try to tie them every week. What do I use for tying? Something that's flexible. I use nylons or pantyhose. I have three sisters. Uh, if they had a run in their pantyhose, I used to ask them, or now I go to the dollar store, the dollar tree, a dollar and a quarter, whatever. Sometimes I buy pantyhose. I take a scissors, I cut them in strips, and it's like one long, I, I wind it up on a, 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 like a ball of yarn, and uh, it's elastic. You tie your tomato with that, you got a little give because your tomato stem that you're tying does expand and grow as a tomato plant grows, it gets a little larger. You don't wanna use like a twist them, something like that that's got any wire, it's gonna cut the stem eventually or it could. So I like using conduit and I like using uh, nylons for tying it up. You can use string, you can use yarn, other things. And as a staking, the next uh, topic that I have down here is pruning. Uh, well, I'll, I'll wait till the next slide. I have another slide on that. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. In fact, yeah, I'll go to that now. First of all, no tomato plant needs to be pruned. I can't say that enough. Uh, if it's healthy, it's fine. Cherry tomatoes should not be pruned. The side suckers that they get, the stems that they develop, will get quite a lot of tomatoes on them and you're cutting, out, cutting down in your yield if you take those suckers off on a, on a cherry tomato. And cherry tomatoes are small, they don't need as much time to mature that uh, it's suggested that you do not prune them on a cherry tomato. And also on beefsteak tomatoes. Beefsteak tomatoes, when they get suckers and shoots, they're not very long and you do get quite a bit of fruit on them. Now, many people, as far as pruning, when you get to the middle of June, they'll remove the lower leaves on their tomato plants about two feet up from the ground. Anything that's lower than two feet, they remove those leaves. Again, the leaves are the most susceptible part of your tomato plant for disease. If those yellow and they get anything, they fall to the ground and it's back and forth between the ground. They, a lot of people remove the lower leaves. Now tomatoes grow shoots and this slide here, this picture is showing, there's a couple circles. Your leaf comes off from the stem and that's called an axle, that spot where the leaf is joined to the stem. I've heard some people describe that as the armpit or whatever. That's where your shoot comes from for vegetative growth. A lot of people pinch those out. When they're small, you can do it by hand. When they're larger, you might need a pruners for it. But that's to keep all the strength in the main shoot of the plant. And your blossoms never come from these little axles on the leaves. The blossoms always come off the main stem separately. They are not by one of these leaf axles. So if you pinch these, you're not cutting that out. You're concentrating the energy into the main stem and blossom production and tomato yield. If your tomato is healthy, I do not prune mine. I keep tying them up and I get tomatoes galore. But a lot of people, and it also has to do with uh, like your heirlooms that it's easier to manage, you have fewer leaves, you have better air circulation by keeping one main stem and not having all the suckers. But the little suckers that are on those 
axles where the leaves join the stem are what you would remove if you care to. Some people remove two or they keep their tomato a certain size. They don't want all the uh, suckers. If you have a low one, you don't want it laying on the ground. Again, if the leaves are in contact with the uh, ground, it's you know more uh, susceptible to uh, disease. Uh, next thing I'm gonna talk about is pests and diseases. And uh, if your tomatoes are healthy, you don't have so much to worry about. I mentioned about the uh, hornworms and uh, that the hornworms are large green, it's the larva, the caterpillar of a certain type of moth. When you check your tomatoes every few days, they can be very destructive. You see holes in your leaves, you see stems missing. Uh, you got to look sometimes hard to find them because they're green and they blend in with the tomato stems and leaves. Uh, the leaves are defecation uh, on the leaves are like black circles larger than mice droppings, but you have to look and generally you don't have very many, but they can do a lot of damage. That's a tomato hornworm. Sometimes the new growth on tomatoes, the tips get aphids. Aphids are little sucking insects. You see them frequently on the new growth on rose bushes. I just take two fingers and I rub them along the stem gently and I squeeze them. You could wear a glove. Insecticidal soap is very effective for aphids and a lot of other things. I think it's best to try to use organic methods and Avoid pesticides as much as you can for our pollinators, for the environment, for the soil, for everything. And uh, their neem oil is an effective uh, thing for many, many different plant diseases. But prevention is, you know, an ounce of prevention is, you know, better than having to worry about a cure or just uh, having the destruction. If you have healthy plants, that's the best. Uh, if you have trouble with raccoons, I have a lot of deer, uh, trouble with possums, things like that. Uh, generally, if your tomatoes are staked and they're growing up, I don't have things climbing my tomatoes, so I might lose a few of the lower ones. You can live trap some of these animals. A lot of municipalities are frowning on that later because relocating them and the, the whole works. Uh, the wilt diseases are from a fungus. And again, the, the mulch helps, but the air circulation and the watering uh, are great. You also want consistent moisture with your uh, tomato plants. Blossom end rot is when your green tomato has brown or black on the bottom of it, and that continues on the tomato as the tomato grows and ripens. That's caused by a deficient, deficiency sometimes in calcium or magnesium, and it's from inconsistent watering. If your tomato plants get dried, uh, they, the soil kind of clumps together. They cannot utilize the calcium and the magnesium that's in the soil. Consistent water will avoid a lot of problems with the blossom and rot also. And uh, like I said, an ounce of prevention is the best thing to do. When it comes to fertilizing tomatoes, they uh, do like to be fed quite a bit. Fertilizer, when you are, there's some that are sold strictly for tomatoes that are say a tomato food. They have little spikes that you can put into the soil, tomato release, time release. More important to fertilize your tomatoes that are growing in a pot, or a container, because as you water them, that's flushing a lot of the uh, nutrients out of the soil, more so than if they're on the ground or a raised bed. Uh, when you fertilize or buy fertilizer, there's three numbers. The first number is nitrogen, the second number is uh, potassium, and the third number, uh, I'm sorry, the second number is uh, uh, third number is potassium, but you got uh, potash. For the second number, the, you do not want to fertilize it with a high first number, the nitrogen. That's mainly for vegetative growth. You get these super healthy plants with very little blossoms, and the potash and the uh, potassium are much more important for the blooming 
the buds and for the roots. So you want something that's kind of general purpose, like a 10, 10, 10 with the numbers on the fertilizer. You don't want that first number to be high, or you want something that's got more of the second and third number. I probably would not use a water soluble fertilizer, like a miracle Grow, where you take a tablespoon and you dissolve it in a gallon of water. I would not use something water soluble in patio tomatoes that are grown in a pot container because a lot of that water with those nutrients is gonna flush out. I would use something that's a granular time release fertilizer, especially for uh, container uh, grown plants. Banana peels are a great source of potassium and uh, you can put banana peels on your garden. You can make a tea where you uh, just put it in a bottle of water, a quart bottle of water with maybe a used tea bag and you let that sit for 24 hours, but uh, to water your tomatoes or put that on, and that's very helpful. I'm gonna talk now about the varieties of tomatoes that are offered at the plant sale this year from FOPCON. And uh, this first slide, the one on the left is Bush Champion. This is a tomato that's ideal for patios and it's ideal for uh, containers. It, uh, is the only one of the uh, plants here that's featured that is a determinant uh, plant. So it's not gonna grow terribly tall. Your gets decent sized fruits, about 12 ounces and uh, good flavor. Most of the fruits are gonna come at a certain time and that the plant's gonna grow to a certain size and that's about it. But they're great for, uh, it has a short season. Your fruits are gonna mature early, about 65 days. And very strongly recommended for a patio or for a container. The next uh, picture is San Marzano. This is an old variety. This is a plum tomato, which is very meaty. It uh, doesn't have a lot of seeds and it doesn't have a lot of moisture. This is what you use uh, for making sauce and uh, bruschetta, things like that. It's, it's not a real juicy tomato, it's a very meaty tomato. Been grown for a long time. It actually is an heirloom, but uh, has huge uh, yields and uh, wonderful for sauce, things like that. Next slide, please. The next two are both cherry tomatoes and uh, chocolate sprinkles and sun gold. These are hybrids. The cherry tomatoes have been bred for good uh, disease resistance, both of these. And uh, they're also tasty. The chocolate sprinkles, it's kind of a, mm, a copper red and it has some green stripes on, on them. They're attractive. And the sun gold, of course, is a yellow tomato, but both are very good uh, as far as a cherry tomato with the smaller fruits and uh, very productive and disease resistant. Next slide, please. The next two tomatoes are beef steaks. And again, if you're doing pruning, you do not want to take your sucker growth off your beef steaks because uh, they don't get that long and they do produce uh, plants. Bean heirlooms, they have a longer maturity. The brandy wine can take 90 to 100 days to mature. The Caspian pink is an improvement on that, which you have a much shorter maturity. It's only 80 days. Brandy wine is a very old tomato going back to at least 1885 renowned for its large beefsteak type tomato. The foliage looks like a potato plant. Uh, the tomatoes can easily be one to two pounds. They'll born one or two, like most heirlooms on a cluster, you only have one or two, but the flavor is supposed to really be great on brandy wines and uh, grown by the Amish initially. Uh, very large. It was known for years as one of the best tasting tomatoes. I say that and then I move over to the Caspian pink, which is also a beefsteak. It's supposed to be an improvement on brandy wine in that the fruits are a little smaller, about 12 ounces. It has a much lower maturity uh, time. You start getting tomatoes that are ripe in after 80 days. And in many different taste tests with tomato lovers, the Caspian pink has outpolled, done better, uh, better reviews than the brandy wine. So there's a lot going for the Caspian pink. Uh, myself, I grow 
Uh, I do like the San Marzano, another one of the plum tomatoes, if you're gonna make sauce in that, are uh, the Roma tomatoes, very similar. Uh, on my main tomatoes, I like to use Better Boys. Better Boys are hybrids, early maturing, about 72 days, known for their flavor and high yields, and also good disease resistance. And I like a yellow tomato too, they're supposed to be lower acid. And for salads or on a plate, I like the combination of uh, colors and flavors. Uh, I think that's about it. I'm gonna open it up or I think we will to uh, some questions now. A few more slides, I'll just comment a little bit about my raised beds. The first one, you'll see things like Swiss chard, carrots, beans. Uh, I don't have much of a weeding problem because you see how thick everything is in there. But with one on the top right is my tomato plants and staked. They, there's nine feet of conduit pole showing above the raised bed, about 10 feet long, and I have a foot you know, buried in the soil. At the end of the season, my tomatoes have gotten to the top of that nine foot pole and drooped and started looping over. And by the time uh, late September, early October comes, my tomatoes are about 12 feet of growth. The first slide way back in the beginning, my daughter and son-in-law were standing in front of the plants and you could see how much taller they were. That picture was in early August. Uh, the bottom uh, picture here on the left is showing the tremendous yields on my plants. And then the one on the right where I'm standing in front, I'm six feet two, so you're getting an idea of uh, how tall those plants are. Next slide, please. And I'm just about ready to wrap it up and go to questions. Uh, the tomatoes on the left are right before a frost, what I've picked and brought inside. I, we've all heard about fried green tomatoes. I never tried frying them, making them. I looked up a couple of recipes. Even people in my family who aren't real fond of tomatoes like them, kind of like a pickle. Uh, the bottom, uh, I take my green tomatoes in the house in the fall and I spread them out on newspaper and let them ripen. I generally have fresh tomatoes through December and those on the newspaper are what I'm ready to make some sauce and work with after ripening in the basement for a few weeks. I use my tomatoes, that's a homemade pizza on the right. For sauce, I do a lot of freezing. I'm gonna do more canning this year because I don't have that much freezer space, but the onions, on, the onions, the peppers, the chopped tomatoes on the pizza and the sauce are all homegrown. So thank you, it's been a pleasure. I wanna thank the friends from FOPCON, especially uh, Judy for all her help in putting this together, but I'd uh, be happy to take some questions now. Awesome, cool, thank you so much. That was a really great talk. That was honestly next level. There's the, the chat has been blowing up. There's a ton of questions. So I think I'm just gonna kind of group them together and I'll ask them of you and then anything else that you know kind of comes up we'll we'll try and tie in. Um, so at the beginning of the talk you talked about determinate versus indeterminate plants and how does someone know if their tomato plant is determinate versus indeterminate? You have to do a little research ahead of time. That's why I spent quite a bit of time in the beginning saying if you're going to grow tomatoes, what is it you're looking for? Are you looking for a certain variety for slicing, for salads, for sauce, whatever? Determine it and determine it. It's usually on that little tag with your tomatoes, or you can go to a website, look up a particular tomato, or write down a few of them that, that you're interested in. It'll give you all that information, like maturity dates and stuff. Most of that is on your uh, little tag when you buy a tub, you know, a cell pack of tomatoes, you buy a, a four-inch pot. When, speaking of um, maturation, are you is maturation date? Is it from when the seeds germinate, or is it from when they're planted outside? What what is that? Um, or when there's a fruit from germination date. From germination. Okay, awesome. All right. So when you shifting a little bit to the actual growing, um, when you have these plants in these raised beds, the soil composition. You know, you you talked a little about compost. Um, is there like a how are you setting up the soil before you plant the plants and what 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 ingredients are you adding specifically i make my own compost and i also use a compost that's available from the city for me uh my beds are pretty uh pretty heavy on compost very much so more than 50 percent okay i have that ability I mean, a lot of us, you know, we have our, you know, our soil is already there. If you can amend it and even your top dressing, uh, 
if you're going to put wood chips on, that's going to conserve your moisture. That's biodegradable, but go for the smaller uh, shred, you know, wood chips rather than the larger size, that sort of thing. But uh, we, a lot of us, we, our soil is kind of there. You're going to improve it. If it's clay, you want to add some organic matter. That's the best thing you can do. But I mean, you're not going to just go and buy gypsum and lime or just start doing things if you don't know what, you know, what you're starting with. Gotcha. Um, speaking of um, compost and amending the soil, how often a time, how often a year are you fertilizing? My, uh, because I have so much compost in mine, it's not so bad. Uh, every, every two weeks during the June through September, probably every, every two weeks is good. Okay. You have recommendations on your fertilizer, depending on what type you're using. Osmo is a good brand, miracle Grow. There's many, many different fertilizers. Bone meal is a slow release. It's very good when you're planting them and it's, uh, you know, you don't have, don't have a high nitrogen number. Gotcha, gotcha. I think also someone just suggested in the chat, eggshells and coffee grinds. Uh, eggshells are calcium. Uh, they take a long time to break down. I do add them to my compost. Coffee grounds are a very mixed uh, subject, a controversial subject. People who are thinking of using coffee grounds might want to go online. They were popular for a long time. If you went to Starbucks, you went to your favorite coffee place, you, uh, they'd have grounds you could take home in a bag that are, you know, are used grounds. The thinking lately is that even if you're using grounds that have, you know, you know, they've, they've already been brewed, there is still caffeine in the grounds and the caffeine is doing more harm than good. The caffeine is not liked by our earthworms and many of the bacteria and things that are in the soil. Even if you're doing your own coffee at home and it's decaffeinated coffee, there's still some caffeine in there. Uh, coffee grounds are kind of controversial right now, whether or not they're doing a lot of good. Gotcha, gotcha. That's good to know. It's good to know. Um, so when you are watering your plants, first off, is it possible to overwater a raised bed? It's much less likely to overwater a raised bed than it is to water, uh, you know, one on the ground. And of course, you don't want to plant your tomatoes to begin with in a low spot that where water collects or whatever. They don't like to have their feet in water, you know, continually like that. Uh, I suppose anything's possible, but it's much less likely that you could overwater a raised bed. Gotcha. How often are you watering your tomato plants? That's kind of a loaded question. It depends on your weather. If you have a rainy week, I might not water them at all that week. You know, if you've had about, you're supposed to have about an inch of water a week. You can go to most any weather site online and you can look and it'll tell you how much rain you had. It's best to put your zip code in because Say you did that for Chicago, the city of Chicago is so such a wide area. What's happening in O'Hare might be not, not be what's happening at the lakefront. So if you put your zip code in on a weather site, it'll give you what the precipitation was for each day that previous month or whatever. Gotcha, gotcha. I really liked your idea of the conduit um, to really get the, the tomatoes growing high. How are you connecting the tomatoes to the conduit? Nylon strips that I cut from pantyhose or from That's nylon. Right. That's right. I remember you saying that. Um, you can, and there's other types of things. Instead of just using yarn or you twist them, you want something that's got that flexibility that's going to have a little give to it. Gotcha. Less. Gotcha. Um, two, two more questions about kind of growing. Um, when do you start seeds for here in this Midwest area? If you start them too early, unless you have ideal growing conditions, they can become too lanky, uh, they're very thin, and then uh, you put them out, and boy, you have a windy day, forget it, they need to be sheltered. Uh, I'd say April 1st, you can still plant seeds indoors. I would, in the next, probably in the next week is ideal. I wouldn't go too much later than, uh, you're going to put your plants outside. Our late last frost-free date here is generally about the middle of May. And most of us like to get our vegetables in our vegetable garden beds between the middle of May and the end of May. I would uh, grow seeds for tomatoes anywhere from April 1st to about April 15th. Perfect. And then someone had a question. What happens if your tomatoes have yellow leaves? What is that a sign of? Oh, your tomato leaves are, when they get yellow, uh, 
of course they could be old, you know, they age, then uh, they are gonna turn yellow or then brown and then fall, but <clears throat> it can be water either too much or too little that can cause yellowing leaves. Inconsistent watering. Gotcha. Um, so let's shift to a few issues. What causes tomatoes to split? Again, uneven water, especially when you have hot days and you have the temperature fluctuations. Uh, again, I promote putting a mulch or putting something on top of your soil. That's going to moderate your soil temperatures and also your moisture level. Gotcha. Really it's from the from the weather, and uh, generally it's the heat where you got or you get weather flu temperature fluctuations. Gotcha. Um, I really liked what you were saying about um, the basil and the hornworms because hornworms are a huge issue. Um, except if you have reptiles, they're not that much. It's just free food, right? Um, but when you talk about planting basils nearby, how many how many basil per tomato plant? How close? Um, can you provide a little bit more insight into that? I I mean, it's the scent of the basil that's really doing it. So I don't think they need to be terribly uh, close. And I don't think you need a whole lot. I mean, even, uh, you know, if you plant it in the corners around wherever your tomatoes are, I like basil and I grow a couple kinds. I have a uh, regular, like a Genovese, that's the green leaf. And then I like the purple leaf, just again, the color. But uh, I have a whole whole row of tomatoes, uh, of, of basil, excuse me, along the side of my tomato bed, but that's not necessary. I would think one plant for every maybe four or five tomatoes and they kind of like surround the area or, you know, a quadrant or a perimeter, uh, you know, at the corner, kind of in the corners of your tomato space. Gotcha. Um, is there, I know you highlighted a few plants not to plant around tomatoes. Um, is there a place that people can look up maybe a more comprehensive list or is there, you know, anything else to provide sure. around that? Inter the internet is just a, fantastic source of information for anything. But yeah, we just do a search, uh, companion plants for tomatoes. And you'll get the uh, pluses and minuses. And uh, most, if you look at more than one site, it's good when you got agreement, where you got two or three sites that are telling you the same thing. You can kind of put a, you know, a little more credence in that. Yeah. Uh, instead of, well, this worked for me or that worked for me, to get uh, a consensus. Gotcha. And then this is something I have, especially with those, those indeterminate. What do you do with tomatoes? Do you have any like recipes with those tomatoes that it's a frost is about to happen, but they're not fully ripe. And so you don't want to lose them, but you know, they're not fully ripe yet. So what do you do with those? Like I said, I put them in my basement on a, a, a workbench, but anywhere. And I just line a single layer in newspaper. And uh, I have to, fresh tomatoes ripening through the middle of December. The first month, the ones that were even totally green are that are ripening early, that were you know pretty pretty good size. Uh, they're perfect. I'm still giving those to neighbors. Once they get a little further into the fall and it's November or something, maybe I'll have a few spots and they're not perfect. I will work with them myself and you know for salads and just cut out anything that might be bad. But uh, those I'm not giving away. And I've also found several recipes for, well, I have one that I like that had very good ratings that, uh, for fried green tomatoes. And I'm using several of my green ones. Uh, it went over very well with the family a few times. Awesome. I think that's kind of the majority of the questions in the chat. Um, maybe we can open it up to see if anyone wants to. It's wonderful too. If you have a surplus of any vegetables, tomatoes, zucchini, or whatever, sometimes your zucchini plants just get so productive and okay here's zucchini you're taking it to work and oh no i got enough food pantries they love to get fresh produce this is really an unusual thing for some of them but if you don't have friends and neighbors that you can give your produce to most of the food pantries are thrilled to get fresh produce it's a great it's a great idea thank you hey wayne I can't thank you enough. You guys, this is awesome. amazing. We just learned so much. I'm just sponging everything up that you had to share. And I'm so grateful for you um, being an, our expert tonight and sharing all that information with us. And I just want to say that as soon as I learned about the conduit poles, 
last year at the plant sale from Dwayne, I literally ran out and bought those poles and I used them last year and they are waiting to be used again this year. So um, I'm going to try, I'm going to keep trying. Mine have not gotten 10 feet tall though. <laughs> um, I, I'm, I'm just figuring it out as I go, but um, I definitely um, love that concept. And um, I bought indeterminate, I've got um, indeterminate tomatoes planned for the garden and um, I'm gonna try to get them to grow tall. So anybody wanna unmute um, if you want to hang out for a few more minutes or ask questions that we didn't get to, um, please do. But um, Dwayne, thank you so much for being with us tonight and everybody yep. for tuning in.